<coughs> ok, <coughs> Rob Crier, uh, uh, ezit un pic cum să-i pronunț numele, ar, ar, ar fi trebuit să, să, să aflu de pe internet uh, cum se pronunță corect, pentru că e între Franța și Germania, uh, <coughs> îl pronunț cu anume ezitare pe, și îmi cer scuze pentru ea. Uh, el e, a fost, este luxemburghez, deși trăiește la Berlin și fratele lui este chiar mai faimos într-un fel decât uh, Crier pentru că a ajuns să fie arhitectul prințului Charles, mă refer la Leon Crier. Uh, deci ambii frați în, în postmodernism au însemnat foarte mult. Uh, el e și, e și sculptor. Uh, și în multe din lucrările lui uh, participă și ca sculptor, adică și include sculpturile în, uh, în ansamblurile de, loc, de locuințe în general pe care le construiește. Uh, o să vedem exemple. Ăsta e domnul Rob Crier, seamănă destul de mult cu fratele lui. O să vedeți o... Ah, sorry, I'm talking in, in, in Romanian, but... Uh, I forgot that this whole series, and uh, I, I regret in a way, but because I send it also outside of the country, uh, I'm, I'm forced to talk in English. So now I, be, I begin to talk in English. So Rob Creer is um, is uh, uh, is a man who is not so uh, uh, present any longer. Although he built in Bilbao, for example, after. Frank Gehry built his uh, Guggenheim uh, Museum, uh, uh, rather large building, which you are going to see, which is so very different from uh, what uh, Frank Gehry did. So, uh, <laughs> does he look like a sculptor? I don't know, maybe an unusual kind of sculptor in a way, you know, he <laughs> looks rather like a CEO or a banker than a, than a sculptor, but then we shouldn't uh, be carried away by um, preconceptions about how a sculptor is supposed to look like. And here they are, the two brothers, Leon Creer uh, in the foreground, and then uh, behind him, uh, Rob Creer, the, uh, not so young, but still restless um, uh, brothers from Luxembourg. Uh, aristocrats, no doubt, and uh, it's not an, an accident that Leon Creer became uh, uh, Prince Charles' um, uh, architect. Anyway, um, but they are both interesting, and I actually attended a, a lecture by uh, Leon Creer, not by Rob Creer, at Columbia University in New York, and I even wrote then uh, an, uh, an essay about uh, what he uh, about what he said. Some drawings by Rob Creer. So again, today I will talk about three architects. Uh, Rob Creer is the first one. He drew a lot, uh, and uh, I remember, uh, you know, uh, in the in the seventies and early eighties, his drawings were inspirational because they they had, uh, you know, uh, uh, an interesting uh, graphic flavor, and you can you will see in in some of the images that uh, uh, that I show. Also, what distinguishes Creer um, um, and also his brother from uh, many architects is that they also were uh, so-called urban planners. So they. They, they were not concerned just with uh, individual buildings, but also with um, what is called uh, urbanism. And you can see here a sample of his drawings. Um, you know, it's uh, he drew, he draws uh, well, but uh, the problem is, and, and, and this is a problem, and I struggle with it myself. When you draw, you can be seduced by the beauty of the drawing and neglect the, the, the specificities of, 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 of the act of building and of the reality of the building. So it, it, it often happens that a beautiful drawing is not generating, or maybe not often, but sometimes a beautiful drawing doesn't necessarily generate a beautiful building. 
uh, it's because they, they are two mediums in a way and and um, and also it's possible the other way where a, a drawing which is not beautiful uh, does generate a good building it depends what you think of when you when you draw uh, if you are too aware of the plasticity the lyricism the, even the poetry of the drawing you might miss uh, something of the truth of the building as as built and um, with this I struggled and I still struggle myself. Elements of architecture. He published, he taught, he taught in, uh, in Vienna for many years. Uh, and uh, and uh, his books uh, have a touch of nostalgia, which, uh, you know, the cynics might immediately, um, you know, uh, criticize and, uh, you know, uh, especially from our time, this kind of nostalgia is perhaps a little bit, um, you know, questionable, although nostalgia could also be positive. <clears throat> and uh, it's enough to watch the movie uh, Nostalgia by Andrei Tarkovsky to understand the nostalgia. <clears throat> nostalgia uh, is not necessarily something to totally avoid. But it's also dangerous because uh, you could become entrapped in its seductions and forget to, to, to live in the present and to act uh, vigorously in the present. But his, his drawings are, um, uh, they still, I still like them. And, um, you know, he, <clears throat> he had and has a singular voice, so to speak, in architecture. But I, I would say, especially for us, for Romanians, he is dangerous because we, we, we as far as I'm, I don't know if I'm objective, but I think we, we can be uh, easily uh, uh, victims of, uh, of uh, sentimentalism. And um, in this sense, perhaps we need more uh, uh, balancing from uh, coming from the Anglo-Saxon world across the ocean or not, but the, Although surprisingly, he, he is not—he is not a Latin man. He is not from the South, really, and uh, and yet his nostalgia could uh, could uh, generate sympathy, a dangerous sympathy, I think, in, in some of us. Not this cartoon, uh, but you see here uh, um, renderings, uh, you know, um, manually drawn on the left, and then an approximation of one of his sculptures. Uh, and uh, it's kind of interesting to compare his sculpture with his architecture, because his sculpture is actually more abstract, even, I mean, it is figurative, but you see it's, 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 it's kind of like the slaves of Michelangelo, it's unfinished, it's incomplete, and in its incompleteness uh, lies uh, its uh, modernity. In a way, his sculpture is more mysterious than his uh, his architecture. Maybe because his sculptures show uh, um, a certain amount of, uh, of suffering, of struggle. Maybe it's not an accident that I recall the slaves by uh, by Michelangelo, but his buildings. Um, may, if his buildings would have found inspiration in his sculptures. If his buildings were wounded, as his sculptures seem to be, or the, what they represent, I think he would have gained. But he, he, he doesn't address uh, the wound in his architecture. And I think this is a problem. Um, we could uh, replace the word wound with the word uh, fragility or vulnerability. Uh, th there are other words that we could use. Sorry for the resolution of these um, of these drawings. Now you look here, this building. You know, this is almost. Uh, uh, I mean, it's very similar to the Chicago Tribune as it was built, a neo-Gothic building. And um, do we need something like this today? I, I don't think so. To be honest with you, it's it's. Uh, uh, I 
searching for materials about him, I, I came across a, um, a question. Someone writing about him said, uh, this is a historicism or it fairy tale architecture. Is it a historicist architecture or a fairy tale architecture? I don't know, but, but uh, there is a risk here to, to create a, um, phantasmagoric architecture imbued with um, excessive nostalgia. And, uh, but this was, uh, this was the time then, this was postmodernism. Uh, and his brother also cultivated, uh, and so does Prince Charles, you know, uh, this aristocratic distancing from uh, some of the miseries of today uh, doesn't matter how well intentioned, are, are still, uh, I think, problematic. Like, for example, uh, his brother Leon Creer designed, uh, you know, a utopian city where, you know, people were at the brasserie, they were, were reading newspapers, they were probably talking in Latin, but nobody was actually working. Nobody, uh, I mean, you know, the architect never suggested how that newspaper arrived at, on, in, in the hands of the aristocrat who spoke Latin and sat at the, in the brasserie. So th there is a, a risk here, you know, and, and, but in their case is probably partly explainable because they came from this very special, uh, unique place, uh, Luxembourg or Luxembourg, where, you know, they have a very high level of, uh, of, of, of living. I mean, you know, they have the highest um, you know, national product for per, you know, uh, uh, person uh, and then the highest income. And so they are, they are spoiled, you know, it's, it's, you cannot talk to them about proletarians and so on because they probably wouldn't understand. Uh, but, but uh, this being said, uh, there are qualities that in, in his drawings, uh, I would say more in his drawings than in his architecture, his built work. He published a lot, you see here, Colin Rowe, you know, wrote the foreword to his book, Urban Space. Both brothers were very concerned with the urban space. So as I said, they were not interested just in what is called architectural objects, but also in, uh, in the larger issues having to do with the city, particularly, uh, you know, neglecting to an extent uh, some of the harsh, uh, harsh realities of what a city is. It is an ar a nostalgic, uh, nostalgic approach uh, to architecture and you cannot really, you know, you, you, you cannot bring back, uh, I mean, look at that car there, you know, all by itself and uh, uh, it's inadequate there really, you know, the, the world of technology is not assumed with, with what it is. I mean, this kid is, is crossing the street with a little dog, uh, you know, as if on that street there are no, uh, you know, countless vehicles and so on. And uh, the drawing is seductive, of course, but the architecture, if built in this way, I would say less so. Now we look at, uh, at uh, something he did in Berlin, uh, the International Berlin, uh, I don't know if I, what exactly IBA stands for, Berlin invited in 1987 or so uh, some very important architects to build uh, blocks of flats usually. And uh, he was one of those architects and many others very important at that time were invited. Uh, and uh, I mean, even, uh, well, Le Corbusier built in the fifties, but in the eighties there were Aldo Rossi, John Haydack, uh, Hans Hollein, Rob Creer, uh, Joseph Klaikus, and, and so on, important uh, architects, even Rem Kolhas. Um, and the, he, he built, I think he built several. I, uh, it was a little bit difficult for me to, to find out correctly uh, how many buildings he built, but you'll see samples of his architecture in Berlin. Uh, 
of course, when the ivy attacks the building, uh, things are just fine because, uh, you know, the ivy takes care of the aesthetics of the building very well. Um, this is the model of, uh, of uh, this building, this particular building. It's a little bit rhetorical. It's a little bit, uh, you know, uh, it's some kind of a strange combination between uh, cubistic uh, aesthetics and also a certain nostalgia for a certain past. Um, you see a sculpture by him here that, that you know, accompanies uh, the building that he himself uh, design. I personally like more what, uh, for example, Alvaro Siza built uh, in, uh, in Berlin, the Bonjour Tristesse building, which is not so explicitly uh, rhetorically connected with a certain kind of, uh, a certain kind of past. This is kind of a paradox that um, these two brothers, Leon and Rob Creer, or Robert Creer, uh, Rob comes from Robert, they um, seem to entertain a certain um, liking for uh, what the empire stood for. And again, it's not an accident that um, Leon Creer became a Prince, Prince Charles uh, beloved uh, architect. But the idea to bring uh, sculptures into the building uh, or on the building is not necessarily bad. What is perhaps questionable is uh, if you, you look at the building, it has one spirit and then the sculpture has another spirit. And um, it's, it's, they don't truly seem to be born from the same uh, sensitivity or, or, or the same mind. Why, why wouldn't he use also abstract uh, sculpture, for example? You know, why only these, uh, you know, uh, literal representations of some kind of a human being? Plus, it's, it's excessively about a human being. But this is his culture. You know, you cannot really comment on, on, uh, on the choice of the subject of an artist. That's what he chose. Uh, this is an address in Berlin where he built um, another building is this one, uh, which has an interesting asymmetry, uh, not so much uh, uh, easily uh, noticeable uh, with the ivy on it, but here you can see it's symmetrical and yet asymmetrical. And uh, he also uses the color to amplify a little bit this uh, asymmetry. But the reference to explicit reference to the past could be uh, a little bit, um, you know, tiring or, uh, you know, what can you do? It, it, it happened in the 80s um, uh, in Europe and not only in Europe in the United States as well. And even in Japan, postmodernism was, uh, was uh, seductive and uh, it made it many, many, many victims, I would say. Uh, so deconstruction came as a reaction to, to this uh, nostalgia and uh, it was, it was, uh, although at first uh, I myself criticized it, but it was, a, you know, a fresh air in a way, you know, in its turbulence, it, 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 it wanted to get rid of, of this, uh, you know, I mean, look at these centralities, you know, this, this building is evoking a social structure, which is hopefully even not ours any longer, you know, it's, it doesn't really belong to us, this kind of, uh, of, of plan, I think. But then even, uh, even um, uh, Taller de Arquitectura from, uh, from Barcelona, they also succumbed to the uh, seductions of uh, postmodernism once they left uh, Barcelona. This is, a, a, you'll see some words about this, an evening with uh, Robert Creer in, uh, in Vienna, 
uh, and I will allow myself to read it. The Luxembourg architect and sculptor Rob, Robert Creel, born in 1938, professor at the Vienna University of Technology since 1976, brought a romantic variation of the postmodern modern discussion on urban development to Vienna with his designs based on striking Im imagery studies and publications. Creer has inf influenced a whole generation of architecture students without resorting to the creation of anything approaching a formal school. What he taught, the experience is gleaned by his former students and the lessons they learned in their time with him are the topic of this evening. So this was the description of that uh, gathering in Vienna. A brief talk by the architect who currently lives in Berlin is followed by a panel discussion with his former fellow campaigners, uh, campaigners from his time in Vienna to bring along insufficiently appraisal epoch in the history of architecture into the present. May contain traces of nostalgia, indeed. So um, this is a building um, uh, he did, uh, well, several buildings in Vienna and uh, you know, uh, that was the time. What can we do? They look a little bit strange, but uh, uh, who knows? Maybe, maybe in some years we'll look differently at, at this kind of work. Maybe. Uh, Camilo Zite Platz in, in Vienna. Uh, again, uh, his uh, statues, his sculptures, with, uh, which actually seem to represent him. And I think he was influenced by, um, by the slaves, by Michelangelo uh, or Michelangelo. Um, you will see some pictures of this uh, round, uh, round building here. I would have liked, as I said, uh, some of the, the tumultuous uh, imperfection or more unfinishedness uh, of, of, of the sculptures to be also reflected by the architecture, but the architecture is, seems to be more self-assured than the sculptures. And I don't think uh, art is supposed to take all by itself on its shoulders this task to show the problematics of life, uh, the, the, you know, the, uh, all the imperfections, all even the misery of life, even, uh, you know, the, yeah, the, the, you know, the ephemerality of life, all these things could also be poetically uh, represented by architecture, but his architecture doesn't do that. Uh, it is as if the sculpture is one thing and, 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 and the buildings, uh, are another thing. I mean, what does this elevation have to do with the sculpture? Nothing. <clears throat> While in the past, for example, you know, in the Renaissance, the spirit of the sculptures was um, the same as with the spirit of the buildings. But here, you know, the sculpture as one uh, uh, aesthetic form of, of aestheticism or aesthetics and uh, building another. And uh, I don't know, uh, it seems to me problematic. Now a house in, in Stuttgart, uh, he worked as you see with uh, clear cut geometries. And then he began to uh, sometimes to distort a little bit. What is strange, he worked with uh, um, Oswald Matthias Ungers, a very, very good uh, German architect and, and I think here is surprise with Fry Otto. And uh, I don't know what he got from Fry Otto because I didn't see any trace. And he worked, I think, for about three years with Fry Otto. There is nothing in the, in the work of Rob Creer that would make one think that he worked with Fry Otto. Some connections with Ungers there might be, but not with Fry Otto. I wonder what he was doing there for three years. Anyway, uh, voluminous cubes, uh, his brother Leon Creer also worked with the voluminous, even more voluminous cubes uh, because uh, his brother also assumed the public dimension 
of, of the cubes he was employing. I like Rob Freer when he's more modern, you know, like in this building. Actually, what he built in Luxembourg uh, or Luxembourg is more modern and, and refreshingly so. Uh, we are going to see um, um, a little bit later on one or two buildings that he built in, in Luxembourg. Uh, his drawings are good, uh, but they are illustrat illustrative graphic efforts. They are not, uh, um, they are nice as illustrations, yes, but um, the architecture itself of this room, for example, I wouldn't call it, uh, you know, amazing. But, but you see, when he's modern, like here, I think he's fine, uh, even by today's standards, where he, he gets, where, where he eliminates, um, um, where he eliminates uh, nostalgia. I think he's uh, an architect who is uh, convincing. But when he brings in uh, the sweetness of, of the past, uh, I think he is uh, doing himself a disservice. Sorry for the resolution of this uh, of this page. I mean, there is symmetry, but. Uh, the clear cut geometry uh, offers the building a, a resolute uh, modernity. Now, this house is one of his most interesting uh, works, uh, also in Luxembourg. Uh, it's a cube, but he is able to, um, to, you know, abstract, uh, abstract, if if there is such a verb to abstract, he abstracted the uh, the cube and. Uh, so the, again, the references to history are almost uh, uh, banished. And I think that's, that's when he was at his best. Uh, and in this case, although the aesthetics of the sculpture uh, are still different from the aesthetics of the building, somehow I think they, they, uh, they work together better than in, uh, than in some other buildings um, that he did. 1974-1975. Um, it's not very clear to me what happened with this building uh, because I, there is a picture here. Uh, maybe it was even deserted or something. You know, maybe the the, the people in Luxembourg didn't uh, enjoy this kind of uh, brutal modernity, if I am to call it so. Um, but I, I, it's one of his best works, in my opinion, exactly because he was less nostalgic. There are certain similarities here a little bit uh, with uh, with the houses by uh, Mario Botta. Uh, not so much in the tectonics of the building or chromatically, but uh, uh, you know the geometry and the cut corner and uh, you know there is something of, of of that that time and you know indeed that time also Mario Botta was doing a lot of uh, villas that were uh, some of them quite uh, quite interesting we saw this uh, these plans already uh, section ah 
I don't know if he did this, but uh, it does look good. Uh, usually this kind of, um, you know, mathematical or geometrical uh, uh, speculations uh, accompany some buildings by Alberti, and maybe they were done by Alberti, but more, I think, uh, were done by, by, by people afterwards. Uh, uh, now, uh, an ensemble of a complex of buildings in, in the Netherlands. Strange, no? I mean, the Netherlands, we think when we think of the Netherlands, we think of uh, Rampolhas, no? We think of, uh, uh, you know, avant garde architecture, an architecture that is uh, certainly not sweet. But here we see the other side of the Netherlands. They commissioned. Uh, they also commissioned Aldo Rossi and uh, so, but, but uh, Rob Creer is uh, actually pushing, uh, uh, <laughs> pushing uh, sweetness to higher levels. And I don't think this is something that uh, uh, is, uh, is, is to be uh, followed actually, you know. Um, I don't know, I mean, because it's delusional, it creates an illusion. Uh, the city is not like this. I mean, you see just a little portion of a car here and you see a bike and then, but uh, you know, the reality of the present day uh, city are not quite like this, you know, this, this is a bucolic uh, kind of uh, planning and uh, I don't know. I, I don't find it, uh, you know, quite adequate for, for our time. But uh, it was built. It might be actually pleasant to live there. I don't know. Um, but to me, it's a little bit, it's excessively sweet. And static. You know, placid. Okay, now we look at the work they did, uh, he did in Bilbao, uh, that very Bilbao that a few years earlier built um, the Guggenheim by, uh, by Frank Gehry. And this is the building, of course. But I have to say, Somehow, if I am to choose between these two buildings, I feel more sympathetic towards this one. This one is, uh, you know, uh, its rhetorics um, don't inspire me. Uh, you know, I mean, what's going on here? You know, it's some kind of an architectural bonanza, really. It's, it's. In a way, it's said that uh, this was built, but uh, who knows? Maybe, I mean, perceptions could change. Maybe in time, uh, I myself might change. I don't know. And he, he includes sculptures, but again, they are mimicking a certain past. And I think this mimicking effort is not convincing. There is a problem with historicism. Uh, I think it is. I mean, the spirit of the place should go beyond the, beyond uh, appearances, beyond um, the obvious, beyond uh, uh, you know easy aesthetics. And we don't need historicism. We need history, and 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 even a history, something that transcends the particulars of a certain time. Uh, I don't know if I explain uh, well what, what I wanted to say. Bilbao, Spain, uh, Rob Creer. I go rather quickly because I don't like very much what I see. Uh, and 
the detail of the corner. And this is the last image I show uh, from his work. Uh, the sculptures, the heads are by him as well. Okay, and now we go to the second uh, architect before Antoni Gaudi, and that is uh, um, uh, Joseph uh, Kuipers, if I pronounce well his name. Uh, his father was more famous than, than the son, meaning than him, but he built some interesting buildings, mostly churches. He built a lot of churches. And his, uh, his father, Pierre Kuipers, uh, was uh, very accomplished and, uh, you know, uh, a famous architect in the Netherlands. When the time will come, I will talk about him as well. But today is, is the day when Joseph was born. I have a smaller presentation about him. This was the man, a handsome Dutchman, uh, seems to be intense. And he did build, in my opinion, at least 20, 25 churches. And some of them quite big. Uh, you'll see some of them, a few of them. Uh, he died uh, immediately after the Second World War, I think in 1947. Uh, and um, they, this family uh, is, is um, is a family of architects. The, his son also, so the grandson of Pierre Kuipers, also became an architect and they worked together. Uh, Joseph worked with his father, with Pierre, and then his son, I forgot his name, worked with him. So it, it, it was, a, in a way, a family business uh, architecture. So his first design, a house in a neo-Renaissance style, this is the drawing of the house, uh, fortunately, uh, uh, more contemporary addition uh, was was uh, was uh, brought at the top of the building, and you are going to see it. It's here. So I don't think he had anything to do with the top, but I don't know actually. But. Uh, like this, I think the, the building is, uh, in fact, uh, I think more convincing than the buildings by, by Rob Creer. The drawing shows something else, so I imagine this part was, was built uh, afterwards. But it's not a bad building in, uh, in Amsterdam, I, I, I would say. Now, uh, a church, um, um, Kuiper's first church is built in a mix of neo-Gothic and neo-Romanesque styles and has a big square tower at the crossing, similar to much of his father's later work, notably the St. Augustinus in, um, it may, I can pronounce this, deep choir. Uh, choir. Uh, the interior is one of the first examples of the use of brick in different colors. That there were the, uh, this this phenomenon of um, you know differently colored uh, uh, bricks uh, came uh, later to, to the Netherlands, and um, I, I I still think that the building I mean I don't know maybe this is a little bit too massive, uh, but still this was his first church from a large number of churches and. Um, you see here the, the, the colored bricks. Bricks in general are nice and when they are colored are additionally nice perhaps and um, they should be employed, but not, uh, not uh, with that nostalgia that Rob Creer had maybe. Even very small villages in the Netherlands have some very impressive churches. Now, this is his perhaps his best known and, and most important work. It's a giant cathedral uh, and uh, it's fine. You know, it doesn't matter where you look at, uh, it, it, it's fine. It, it's, it's a good building, I would say. This he built by himself without his father.
not the smallest on earth, that's for sure. It's interesting that the Netherlands um, have the reputation of being a very modern, forward-looking society, and it is a country, but also they do have innumerable churches, countless churches. I have myself books with the architecture from the Netherlands, and I, I was surprised to, to see how many churches they built, a lot. I mean, just this man, just this architect built 2025. I didn't count them, but there is a site where you see church after church after church after church, and not uh, insignificant buildings at all, like this one. But not all of them are. This is one of the. But look at this interior space; is uh, impressive. And they're not afraid of uh, bringing in the new, so to speak, like this metallic bridge here. Okay, now uh, this is the, the um, stock exchange in Amsterdam. So it's a profane building, it's not a church. Uh, mostly he did churches, but uh, he also um, uh, built a few buildings which are not uh, serving a, a religious purpose. And this is one of them. That spire looks more interesting than the building, but um, underneath it, but uh, still uh, something in the building that is worth uh, um, contemplating. Okay, another church from the turn of the century, uh, almost 1900s. Um, this church was begun, I think, by his father and then uh, drastically modified by the son from what I read. But it is uh, usually associated first with his father, but I read um, better knowing sources which said that actually in, in good measure is his work. It is shown both as be belonging to him and to his father. But uh, we saw the previous um, the cathedral and uh, it, it does seem to have something of, uh, of uh, Joseph.
another uh, church, a smaller one. This one is not so interesting, perhaps. He's not a great innovator. Uh, he's working rather, and he had partners, his father, his son, and then he had another partner, an architect whose name I do not recall. And they, they, they did together, they worked together. So, um, but still, I think he was, a, he was a good architect. 1917, 1921, here, from what I read is the influence of his son was also an architect and who had a liking for uh, expressionist architecture and uh, you know the commentator uh, commentators uh, mentioned this uh, moderate expressionism of the building as being the influence of his son And this is, I think, the last uh, slide. Uh, I found this um, by accident, this, um, you know, this wording, uh, which I think um, should make us think that fascination is the key to quality. And it is probably true that if, if you are fascinated by something, by a subject, uh, that fascination makes you uh, you know, have high standards and, uh, and have passion. And uh, maybe, maybe it's necessary to, to be as fascinated as possible in, in our work. Uh, but how to bring fascination into, into what we do, it's not always easy. But I like this, fascination is the key to uh, quality. And uh, talking about fascination, now we'll go to Antoni Gaudi. Uh, he died 95 years ago. And uh, indeed, his work uh, continues to fascinate. He was uh, nicknamed God's, uh, God's servant, the servant of God. And he died today, 95 years ago, in, in, in rather strange... Uh, uh, circumstances. He was going to another church. He was uh, working in Sagrada Familia, but he was going to another church for uh, um, confessional and for praying, for prayer. Uh, and uh, he was hit by a tram car. And uh, apparently people uh, thought he was a beggar, which makes me, it makes me think that perhaps he was not dressed as an architect. <laughs> That is, he was not dressed like Rob Creer. And uh, only the next day, um, I, he was recognized and, um, you know, he was taken care of, but uh, it was too late and he died at 73. It's actually not Antonio, sorry for that. Oh, Antoni Gaudi, uh, E. Cornet. Uh, so he died on the 10th of June, 1926, so 95 years ago, was a Catalan architect known as the greatest, greatest exponent of Catalan modernism. Gaudi's work have a highly individualized sui generi style. Most are located, Gaudi's works, most are located in Barcelona, including his main work, the Church of the Sagrada Familia. Gaudi's work was influenced by his passions in his life, architecture, nature, and religion. Um, interesting, the order. He considered every detail of his creations and integrated into his architecture such crafts as ceramic, stained glass, wrought iron, ironwork, forging, and carpentry. He also introduced new techniques in the treatment of materials such as trencadis, I don't know what they are, which used waste ceramic pieces. Uh, and uh, for a time like, uh, like ours, uh, concerned with uh, sustainability, maybe there are positive suggestions in his work. 
to use uh, waste uh, materials, uh, many kinds maybe, even like uh, uh, Bart Prince, you know, you know to use uh, ashtrays. Here he was the man. Uh, strange, um, strange uh, how his family lived. Uh, his father lived for a long time. He died over 90, but he had two uh, siblings, uh, sister and a brother who died in their 20s or so, so very young. Uh, so I guess the longevity is not necessarily connected with, uh, uh, you know, with ancestry. I don't know, but, uh, you know, fate is also playing a role and, uh, you know, some people live long lives, others die young. He died at 73 in the circumstance that I mentioned. So Antoni Gaudi was an architect from Catalonia who belonged to the modernism, Art, Art Nouveau movement, and was famous for his unique style and highly individualistic designs. As an architecture student at the Escola Tecnica Superior de Arquitectura in Barcelona from 1873 to 1877, Gaudi achieved only mediocre grades, but did well in his trial drawings and projects. After five years of work, he was awarded the title of architect in 1878. As he signed Gaudi's title, Elias Rogent declared, maybe he was the dean, uh, who knows if we have given this diploma to a nut or to a genius, time will tell. And uh, time did tell indeed. The newly named architect immediately began to plan and design and remained affiliated with the school his entire life. Sagrada Familia, which actually began in 1882, um, and now you see a recent picture, but we'll, we'll go towards the end of the presentation uh, in detail uh, with many pictures about it. Now, El Capriccio, just yesterday well, I talked or we talked about um, capriciousness in architecture. I do believe uh, a certain level of um, capriciousness, at least sometimes, might not be a bad thing. It, it exists in music and it could exist in architecture as well. So here we see uh, uh, Capriccio by uh, um, Antoni Gaudi, 1883-1885. Capricious it is indeed, uh, but uh, but why not? In a way, it's some kind of architectural folly, as uh, the deconstructivists indulge themselves in at one point. This is indeed a fairy tale building, but. Um, it shows Antoni Gaudi's interest from the very beginning. The use of ceramics, I would encourage to happen again. I think the ceramics could add a lot to a building and they could be used in, in, in many ways. And I, I know the work of a Spanish architect, a contemporary architect who did a brilliant, uh, a brilliant uh, futuristic build, building house where he employs ceramic tiles, but very interesting tiles. When the building is uh, is uh, more uh, affected by the elements, uh, seems to be a little uh, more credible in the sense that it's not so, you know, fairy tale like. But it's still a rich and rather interesting building. 
Maybe it was uh, repainted, refurbished, whatever. Obviously, he had a very rich uh, imagination. The interior, though, is less uh, extravagant. Eighteen eighty three, eighteen eighty eight. Another, I would say, good building, where it shows clearly that Gaudi was not going to follow Adolf Loss in his claim that uh, ornaments should be banished. Now, this was not for Antoni Gaudi, and we are glad it was not. You see, there are no graffitis on his building. Now, maybe it was just an accident, but I don't think it is an accident. This building on the right attracted the so-called criminal attention of the graffiti artist, but not this one. This one is already decorated. It doesn't need, you know, the nervousness of the, the artistic gestures of the graffiti artist. And most of the time is like this, if a building is very rich, like this one by, by Gaudi, very few graffiti artists would think of touching them. They touch these uh, prosaic surfaces, which mean nothing and which aesthetically uh, communicate nothing. So this is perhaps something worth uh, uh, thinking about. Now here the you know the, the imaginative powers of uh, Antoni Gaudi are uh, exploding. He was a modern architect, but he loved ornaments. Uh, you take away the ornamentation from here, and you get nothing. The ornamentation uh, plays an immense role, just as it plays in, 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 in uh, some very important works by Louis Sullivan. He was also not afraid of color. As you can see, he loved color and good for him. Uh, remove the ornament from this building and remove color. What do you get? Well, you get our architecture. That's what you get. Although even without the color and the ornaments here, there are interesting things that, you know, if they are ornamental in, uh, in, 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 in their essence but they, they manifest themselves in three dimensions. The, the chromatic exuberance and the ornamental exuberance of Antoni Gaudi uh, are uh, incredible.
Now, another work that is uh, kind of fairy tale here there is in color, but uh, the building is uh, is following uh, the past world's um, a fairy tale world. Um, these are early works, but <clears throat> the previous work I think is one of his best. This one, maybe it's a little bit uh, too predictable somehow, but uh, it's still a it's still a good building in its own way. It's it is a little bit too much uh, fairy tale, but it's more genuine than most buildings built on uh, at uh, the Walt Disney uh, uh, campus, both in the United States and, and France. But I like very much what is happening at the, the inferior levels, where you have the structure, the masonry exposed uh, without, uh, you know, uh, unnecessary sweetness. And I think uh, Antoni Gaudi was a, a, a beautiful structuralist, if we can call him so. Now the Guel pavilions, these are lesser known works, but the very interesting, 1884, 1887, uh, this is an embroidered architecture and look at the gate itself, you know, it's, it's fantastic. It, it, it brings us closer to that fascination that uh, I, I, I mentioned, I quoted uh, about in the previous uh, uh, presentation, but look what's going on here, you know, it's, it's the magic of, uh, of being alive and, uh, and, and, and building. And yes, the building is embroidered. And look at this. You know. Uh, he worked, I guess, with a T-square and a rectangle, but his imagination refused to be ruled by them. Back to fairy tale. There is, uh, I, I would say, some influence coming from uh, from Islam as well. There are many many layers of meaning and many. Um, uh, it's a very rich world, Antoni Gaudi's world. So I guess the, the answer to the dilemma of the Dean of his School of Architecture is closer to not being a nut, but, but whatever the word genius might mean. Although the distance between a nut and the genius is sometimes very, very thin, very small. Palau Guel, as I, as I mentioned, I, I, I love Antoni Gaudi when he's on un, underground or that, yes, there I think is a very elemental architecture to use the, the word uh, Ravenna uses for his office. It's elemental, but it's not simplistic, it's not boring, it's, uh, it's primal, it's archaic, it's Ur architecture. But many things go on here, you know, it's look at this unbelievable richness. I mean, just the, you know, the, the entrance door in, into this building and look at these windows, you know, they are, they are magical. Everything is magical. I'm sure he benefited from great craftsmen. You cannot build something like this without great craftsmen.
mean, look at this. This is this is contemporary architecture at its most, uh, you know, uh, audacious. Done without parametrics, without scripting and programming. How did he do it? I think it's magical. A very interesting building. And look at this, you know, it's <clears throat> now almost uh, Exeter Library in, uh, in Barcelona. Again, whoever thinks that we can banish ornament from architecture should look at these works again. Uh, really, our buildings are very simplistic compared to, I mean, just the basement of this building and is, uh, you know, a lesson in both structure and, uh, and the beauty of structure in an almost ornamental way. Um, uh, it's, it's just a basement, no? It, it's, it, he probably would not have considered this as being truly his building or architecture, and it is, I think it's beautiful. Theresian College, 1888-1889. So he built many other buildings than those usually associated with him. And I think these works, which are less known, are, are, are very important and uh, they, they deserve to be known. Just like we saw uh, the other day in Frank Lloyd Wright, you know, in the Johnson Wax uh, building, here the columns also have three parts, the bottom which connects with the, with the slab, and then the top part which uh, is more elaborate and, uh, you know, connects with what is above. Uh, again, uh, the, we, we, we make columns these days in a very simplistic way by comparison. And they are woven buildings. And uh, I'm glad that at SciArc, for example, the, they have a lot of diplomas around the theme uh, architecture and weaving. And I think we should address weaving also, because it is in the weaving that the ornament, uh, um, uh, you know, develops uh, organically and convincingly and uh, through weaving, the building has this richness that the buildings of Gaudi uh, have.
Well, I think he's at his worst when he is uh, mimicking some kind of uh, medieval uh, fairy tale architecture, like in this building. And there was another one that I showed earlier. I, I, I think he, he's not as convincing here because he becomes too literal and in a way too sweet and too pastoral and too bucolic and, uh, you know, uh, yes, I wish he didn't build it. Uh, in Tangier, uh, ne construit, uh, <laughs> just uh, it was not built, uh, this, uh, this project, but we see anticipations or it was, um, well, the, the work on Sagrada began already, at least in, 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 in the form of uh, uh, starting the project. But here, yes, if we look at this project, this drawing, uh, we, 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 we say this is Antoni Gaudi. Now the Bodegas Guel from 1895 and 1897 are fine works. They are close to becoming fairy tale, but uh, the, the level of abstraction is higher than in the previous building. And I think they are interesting, uh, interesting buildings. You know, and the way the wall and the, and the roof, the wall becomes roof and the roof becomes wall. Uh, uh, they are interesting. They are a little bit, a little bit fairy tale, but uh, the, the, it, it is still, to an extent, a, a sober building. Maybe because of the mono material, and it has a certain level of primitiveness, which makes it uh, tectonically, um, you know, uh, sober and, and, and convincing. Interesting work. Interesting, this huge stone here, uh, you know, <laughs> I wonder where it came from like that. Anyway, um, Casa Galvet, 1898-900, we are getting close to his um, so-called mature work. When he was exuberant, uh, he was at his best. He was exuberant in most of his works, but sometimes he, uh, he was more than in, in, uh, in some other cases. But he didn't work alone. And I'm going to talk a little bit about one of his collaborators at the end of this presentation. Uh, usually geniuses are egocentric. They think they, I mean, they give the impression they work alone and it's never the case. Or very, very, very rarely. Most of the time, I mean, architecture, as you know, is a collective work. And he had, uh, he worked with great uh, craftsmen and also uh, with uh, collaborators, some of them uh, brilliant. He couldn't possibly draw all of this by himself, uh, impossible. So it's possible he had in his proximity other servants of God. Nineteen hundred, nineteen oh one. Again, a building which is a little bit uh, castle-like, and uh, I, I think, uh, with the exception of this, yes, when when he shows uh, sincerely 
how the BRICS, uh, uh, you know, collaborate in order to build a building. I think he's very good at this. And I, I like the fact that uh, the, the brickwork is not hidden with so-called finishes. You know, it's, 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 it's genuine. You can trust it. And it's interesting. And you understand how the building was built. But the exterior, um, although there are interesting details like this, which I love, you know, the exuberance vis-a-vis -vis life, vis-a-vis -vis light, vis-a-vis -vis nature, vis-a-vis -vis color is always a good thing if it's authentical. I always personal my personal taste is for the for the for the basement or for the lower levels here you know not because of him perhaps or not only because of him things are getting a little bit sweet and bourgeois and uh, too comfortable for my taste but the you know the lower levels like this one is uh, has a roughness a rawness which I like Parguel, which of course you know, 1900, 1914, so more than 100 years ago. Um, Did uh, Antoni Gaudi die? I don't think he did. He didn't die. No. And it's not just because of our talk today. It's, it's, he didn't die. These works exist and uh, they, are, they, are, they are alive. Through them, he is alive. I think he loved gravity, the force of gravity. I mean, without the force of gravity, what would his architecture be? As you know, probably uh, Zaha Hadid uh, declared or that he, he wanted to create a vital, uh, raw, uh, earthy, earthly architecture. Well, I don't think she succeeded in that. Her architecture might be vital, but it's not raw and it's not earthy or be belonging to the earth. But Gaudi's work is.
these gardens are interesting. Uh, it's a lesser known work, but uh, I think uh, very, very uh, valuable. You see how the, the, the architecture becomes figurative art or figurative sculpture. And uh, this meeting between abstraction and, uh, and uh, uh, figuration is, uh, is something that he was good at. There is a, a touch of uh, naive art here sometimes. Uh, but uh, even of uh, so-called architecture without architects, but he was an uh, educated architect and he showed it plain, plainly in, uh, in most of his works. But I guess he was not afraid to as assume uh, certain levels of what might be called naivete. I remember what Nietzsche wrote that a great work is uh, both uh, uh, cynical and innocent or naive and you know I, I don't see too much cynicism in, in the work of Antoni Gaudi and I'm glad I don't see it but I do see levels of innocence and in contrast with uh, much of the cynicism of modern architecture his work is very refreshing now this fame, famous this famous work Casamila 1905-1907. Uh, I have been on the roof there and it, it is magical. Uh, I mean just this uh, entrance door is, is is magical. And the the parapets to the balcony at the balconies for the balconies. The gods of fire, in a way. People gather here and they have, uh, well, at least before the pandemic, and hopefully after the pandemic, uh, they will gather again. And you can see the skyline of Barcelona. It's all a creation, an exuberant creation. He wants the building to move, the waves of architecture. Just like in the case of Chambord, here the chimneys are, are, are uniting the humans with the gods. It's possible he also would have been told or was told what Bart Prince was told. This you cannot do, <laughs> but he showed otherwise that it can be done. And uh, we are glad he did it. Now Casa, Casa Batlo, 1905-1907, uh, in a way even more exotic than the previous one. Again, uh, approaching uh, the threshold uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the fairy tale world. I don't think we should uh, uh, banish uh, innocence, in, even naivete. I think we need it. 
because uh, our soul is in a way naive and we should allow it we should allow its innocence to manifest itself why not why should we be morose and so called uh, you know uh, strict and rational and serious as if there is no seriousness here there is but it's a different kind of seriousness it's a seriousness which which acknowledges that life is a dream and it is a dream great thinkers and great artists all 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 of them thought the same way life is a, dra a dream yevgeny mind said a russian poet yevgeny yetushenko yetushenko i um, have some problems to pronounce his name uh, yeah life is a dream and uh, a great um, Swedish uh, writer, uh, Strindberg, said, life is a dream, uh, space and time do not exist. So maybe the architect who is obsessed by space should also think about time. And maybe more importantly, even of life as a dream, as being a dream, a dream we all live for a longer or a shorter time. I mean, look what he did here. The rationalist mind would never do something like this. You know, okay, maybe such a little, you know, balcony could, could, could be done. But what's going on here in the left and the right, you know, it's and what are these plates doing on the on the elevation of the building? Why not? Are we too old for this too so called mature? I don't know. That's why we want to go to 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 Mars, because we, we don't build any longer like this. We got tired of ourselves and of the world, and uh, and uh, we want to leave the earth. But I don't think Antoni Gaudi needed to leave the earth because he 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 brought the the other world, so to speak, down to earth, right here. You remember I, I showed a building by Daniel Lipskin, the dragon, the red dragon, the Chinese pavilion in Milan. Well, he did something very similar to this, but using digital technologies, something Antoni Gaudi didn't have, and yet he do, did it. Well, he did it because he had great craftsmen. I don't think you, he, he did, uh, you know, the meticulous working drawings showing everything. This was done, uh, you know, uh, with a skill of, of great craftsmen and maybe just with a few indications, um, maybe even through words. Students in architecture may be contemplating the work. And what if we think in this way? If, if we build, if we build, let's build in such a way that at the future time, two people just like these two would stare at our building just as they do and not build otherwise. As a Romanian poet said, uh, Stefan Augustin Doinash, only what is a wonder uh, deserves to be. And, and yes, Minune, a wonder, a wonder. I think we should strive, we should, we should make the effort to only build something that is i'm not talking about necessarily expensive things no but to to create a sense of wonder that um, that uh, you know fascination to provoke fascination otherwise otherwise why build there are already enough buildings built now this hotel uh, from 1908 uh, provoked the sarcasm of, uh, of frank lloyd wright 
It was meant for uh, Manhattan. And uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, malicious as he was sometimes, especially towards uh, other architects. Unfortunately, I don't know the, the word in English, but I know it in Romanian. Uh, he said that this is a uh, architectura de suppositoire. Uh, bad boy, Frank Lloyd Wright. He probably liked it. But this was actually to be much, much taller than Sagrada Familia. Now, the Sagrada Familia schools from 1909, uh, a lesson on work and also associated with Sagrada Familia. Uh, I don't know if I have other pictures. I should have had other pictures. Anyway, this is the school of uh, the Sagrada Familia and the Park Duel again. Uh, I don't know exactly why I interrupted uh, uh, this presentation also needs some uh, some uh, work. Now, in my opinion, this is one of his best works. This church of Colonia Guel from 1908-1914, which was not finished, just the crypt was done, and you'll see how much of it was built. Uh, it's, it's very, very nice. Uh, the only thing that was built is what you see with gray here, with all with these colors. From here upwards, nothing was built. But there is glory, beautiful glory, just in, just in this part of the building. I mean, look at this, you know. What engineer could do something like this? For this, you need an artist. But an artist who didn't neglect the, the structural forces. In fact, he honored them uh, more organically and uh, in, a, in a deeper way. Beautiful work. Look at this. It's magical. I think even God might have been a little bit envious of the architect of his servant, Antoni Gaudi. It's magical. You know, why didn't he make the column straight? Why didn't he make, look, all those ribs are all, they're all different from each other. There is no repetition. There is no, uh, uh, yeah, there is nothing dogmatic here. I think it's very beautiful. It's possible that only a servant of God could do something like this. So <clears throat> this is the crypt of the Colonia Guel. Uh, it's different from the Guel Park. Try to compare this work with the banality of much of the work we do, you know. I mean, the engineers in general stay away from something like this because they don't like, you know, additional efforts. For, for something like this, you also need an engineer who himself or herself is a servant of God. If you both, uh, both work for, for, uh, for, for, for God, they, they, they could achieve something that uh, provokes astonishment. But if they only think of the, of the you know, the, you know, to get uh, quickly the job done or, you know, to get their salary or to the, the, the easy way out, they will never make something like this. 
this is uh, uh, shows a different kind of uh, attitude vis-a-vis -vis architecture <clears throat> and uh, you know living living in order to build but to build in a in a way that in is in, in harmony with uh, with one's deepest beliefs like uh, uh, like uh, certainly uh, Antoni Gaudi felt I, I think it's magical it's coherent, but it's also, uh, I mean, it's rational and also irrational. It's coherent, but it, it's also capricious in a way. And it's, 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 it combines opposites at all levels. It has stability, but it also has instability. The building doesn't fall, yet it shows, uh, it shows, uh, uh, you know, the the complexities of life through how it was uh, uh, erected, this beginning of a building, because you saw only a part of it was built. Maybe after the Sagrada Familia is finalized, uh, maybe the efforts of uh, the Catalans will come here to maybe, maybe complete this work. But even if it's not uh, completed, uh, I think it's, it's brilliant and very, very uh, convincing and inspiring. I almost feel like saying God is in the basement. We usually look for God in the skies, but maybe God is in the basement. I think uh, uh, Antoni Gaudi found God in the basement. His basements are brilliant. Would such a drawing, such a so-called rendering be acceptab acceptable today for clients and schools alike? I doubt it. But uh, <laughs> who cares? Antoni Gaudi didn't care. And, you know, he played, I mean, he studied, you know, the static aspects of the building, which also he didn't want to, 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 to honor the, the structural forces of the building without, uh, you know, uh, uh, taking care also of the becoming of the building, and that is the dynamic aspects of the building. Of course, this kind of building is not uh, to be done for any kind of function and for any kind, you know, although you could imagine even houses that would be, you know, somehow relating to, to this building. This is a sacred building. It was supposed to be a church. But there are buildings and there could be buildings modest in size that somehow evoke the same realm of emotions and, and thoughts that this building uh, uh, honors. Even the plan is beautiful. It's a woven plan. It's what it is, it's like the a spider's net. It's embroidered. Casamila again, I don't know why I have this, um, but anyway, we look at a few more pictures with Casamila. I keep saying, and I am saying it to myself first, work without play it cannot be too creative. Here he combined work with playing. I'm sure he didn't do rigorous, uh, how could you, you know, working drawings for this? He just allowed the, the craftsman to uh, manifest his uh, uh, 
uh, own his own creativity and maybe gave him a suggestion and that's it. And then just like in a Gothic cathedral, a conjunction of collective efforts resulted in the great building. Sometimes even with contributions from people who were not uh, so-called specialists. How, how do you measure rigorously such a facade? You know, this is an original drawing from the time. It's really a schematic drawing. Where are the numbers? There are no numbers. It's almost miraculous how they built it. Maybe they were not humans. Maybe, maybe they were extraterrestrials. I'm sarcastic, of course. Why did he make the ceiling in this way? Was he mad? <laughs> yes, he was. He was madly in love with God. He was the servant of God. That's why he did it like this. He wanted to bring the ocean to the ceiling, the waves of the ocean or the sea. Look at this. Sagrada Familia, which you know very well. Uh, and uh, the, the great city of Barcelona is, uh, is, uh, is probably the only city in the world which uh, builds uh, with that fervor that once existed before the Renaissance, when they built the Gothic cathedrals, when a whole city united itself to, to build a cathedral. And they are building it, and it shows great determination. It's a great effort. I'm sure there are difficulties, but Barcelona can handle them. And I'm glad that they didn't try to mimic what uh, Antoni Gaudi did. They continue, but from the present. Uh, and so they continue his work, but use also what is ours. And I think they are wise. And, the, and um, Gaud, Antoni Gaudi can take it. He didn't need a, a placid mimicking of uh, copying what he did. No, no. Uh, it's, it's this continuation between the old and the new, which makes the, which makes life uh, uh, worth living. It's a great effort, and I think it's 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 very inspiring uh, what they are doing. It began with a man, no? A man, but a man with a vision. And then the city moves on. And this is beautiful. You know, uh, it's, it's this continuation, you know, which, which uh, really is a big yes towards life. In this way, the city itself became and becomes a servant of God. And look what they did. It's surreal, is it not? I mean, the building is perforated by light from every side. And light is God.
it's splendid, I think, this collective effort. If this doesn't move, I don't know what can, you know. Uh, this belongs to our time. This does not belong to Gaudi's time. It belongs to our time, but I think Gaudi would have liked it. It's an abstracted forest. And there are, you can find on the web, beautiful pictures, sometimes with unbelievable colors. I don't know, they do uh, light shows there or, you know, with powerful expressionistic colors. It's very, very beautiful. And the sculptures also, you know, they are, um, I, I would say they are, they are uh, properly done. You know, and here, as opposed to the works of Rob Creer, here there is no contradiction or distance between the sculptures and the building. You see the wall behind the sculptures is, 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 is done with the same stone and is done kind of in the same spirit. So um, it's a collective work of great, uh, great imagination. Now, of course, it is a very potent city, Barcelona, but maybe it is potent also because it appreciates culture, it appreciates art, and uh, it invests in art and in culture accordingly. But it started with a man, yes, with a man who planted the seed of this development now. Maybe he himself would not have thought that the building will be developing in the way it does. It's possible. But he planted the seed. And this is the seed of creativity. This is uh, what he built, and this is what they build now, the, the citizens of Barcelona. You know this square, you add the numbers in that whatever way, and you get the, the same number always, 33. It's, uh, it's magical. It was used also in the, that famous engraving by uh, Albrecht Dürer, Melancholia. So it doesn't matter how you add, you know, this way or diagonal, you always get 33. Maybe the symbolism of this, this used to be, uh, it, it was, it was uh, used also in the Middle Ages. Maybe it's, uh, its symbolism has to do with uh, the eternal recurrence of the same. It has a philosophical meaning. It's not just a, you know, a, a game that uh, displayed on the, on the wall of the, of the great cathedral. And I guess these two, this cultural or you know, uh, part uh, is a, is a, it's about love. No, it's about yes, the power of love. This building could not have been built and cannot be built without love.
there is a touch here of uh, Photoshop, but the building by uh, Gaudi, Antoni Gaudi can take it. And now I want to end this uh, still insufficient presentation on this truly great architect with one of his collaborators, this uh, much lesser known uh, architect, but a uh, brilliant architect himself, Joseph Maria Jujol, or Jujol, I don't know how to pronounce in Catalan, uh, in, in Spanish maybe it would have been Jujol, uh, who lived between 1879 and 1949, and he did a few works by himself, uh, and you are going to see them. This was uh, Jujol, uh, Joseph, Joseph Maria Jujol, uh, and uh, he was a good uh, uh, and important collaborator of Antoni Gaudi. And I'll show first some, some contributions from him to the buildings by uh, Antoni Gaudi. Uh, and uh, you wonder how did he do them, you know, how, how would he make the drawings for this? Uh, this is in uh, one of his buildings. There is a book on him. There are several books on him. I have a book on him and uh, he was an excellent architect himself. Uh, uh, both him and Antoni Gaudi were not afraid of the spiral, were not afraid of becoming, they were not afraid of uh, the dynamic representation of a life which was not supposed to be static. I don't think they, they would have admired uh, Descartes too much, although Descartes himself was searching for God in his own way. This is a church he built, Chujol or Hukol, uh, and uh, I think it's very nice. It's a small building, it's not like Sagrada Familia, but it has richness, it has integrity, it has uh, dignity, and it has aesthetical uh, qualities. which shows again, a building doesn't need to be big in order to be good. This is another church he built, also a small church, a small village church, but I think it is interesting. So in a way, these are like small uh, Sagrada Familias. They work together on these buildings. This is an apartment building he built on the diagonal in, in Barcelona, on the, that important boulevard in, in, in Barcelona. This building in the corner, uh, more modern than, uh, you know, <clears throat> so-called modern than the architecture, of, uh, maybe because it wasn't understood, was not quite built as he designed it. Uh, it's a simplified version, but it's still a, a very interesting building. This is also by Jujol or Hujol. Um, you see, he's not uh, shy to not use uh, pictorial representations on the facade. Again, you cannot remove 
ornamentation from his work or, or Gaudi's work. It's impossible. Okay, that's it. Um, that's about it today. I was a little bit tired by, uh, but.